So we are still in our series on Ephesians and we're up to chapter three, which is getting towards the midpoint and the major theme of Ephesians in the first half and up to now has been that through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Gentiles, which essentially just means those who are not Jews, so you and I, are made welcome and able to join the family of God. So Paul actually summarizes this right way back in chapter one by saying, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. It's hard for us today to appreciate what a huge surprise this was, how unexpected this was. We take it for granted that we are welcome in the people of God, but this wasn't so uh, back in Jesus' day. This is a mystery, says Paul, even though there have been pointers all through the Old Testament, through the prophets, that maybe this is what was gonna happen, still nobody was expecting it. Not the Jews, not the Gentiles, not even the disciples were expecting that this was what the plan was. Paul says this mystery, this surprise, is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. So it's not that, that Israel was not expecting a Messiah. Israel has been expecting a, a Messiah for hundreds of years, longing for this Messiah to appear. The surprise is that they didn't think that this was what he was going to do. So although the Old Testament prophets do speak about the Messiah as someone who's going to bring peace and justice and righteousness, who's going to open the eyes of the blind and free the captives, by the time that Jesus appears, Israel is a land and a people under occupation. We might think of, of France under Nazi occupation. They are under oppression of the Roman authorities. And what they're expecting, or maybe more accurately what they're hoping for, is that this Messiah actually isn't gonna be a Prince of Peace. This Messiah is going to be a nationalistic, political, even military leader. And almost their test for many of the Jews, the kind of test, if someone came along and claimed to be the, the Messiah, the test was, are they gonna overthrow the Romans and put us back at the top of the pile? And we see in uh, this throughout Jesus' ministry, evidence of this in John's gospel. You may remember there's a part where John explains that in the particular situation where uh, Jesus was preaching and ministering, Jesus just suddenly knew that there was a real risk here, that the people were going to, as he said, take him and make him king by force. And so he quickly withdrew. We even see with the disciples after the resurrection, they are asking Jesus, so right, is this now the time? Is this it now you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So what, uh, what Paul is describing is really very, very different to what they were expecting. It's even so radical that um, you know, instead of crushing Rome and excluding everybody else, what Jesus has actually done is actually opened a way for the Romans, of all people, along with all the other Gentiles, to become part of this family of God. This is how radical this news is. Um, and I think you can, if you read through Ephesians, I think in my mind anyway, I can hear something of the breathlessness of, of Paul, even as he's saying it again, he can't quite believe it himself. So Paul in his letter may be expecting, some people are still a bit confused about this, you know, does this mean then that God has changed his mind? But Paul says no. He says this is, was always part of the plan. He says, this is what God, who created all of this stuff in the first place, by, by the way, has been doing in secret, behind the scenes, all along. 
His plan has always been, as he says in chapter one, to bring unity to all things in heaven and earth under Jesus Christ. So God has always had a plan. And the Bible, from start to finish, if you've ever read, and if you haven't, I would really encourage you to take, take your time, but read it actually right the way through from start to finish. The Bible is a progressive revelation of God's plan. So in very simple terms, you might think about it, it has four main parts, the Bible. It has creation, then there's the fall, then there's redemption, and then there's consummation. So creation, we are in the very beginning. We are in Eden. We're in paradise. And we're going to end up in paradise as well, with the new heaven and the new earth. We're starting in paradise, and God is bringing us back to that paradise. The second stage after creation, which was fall, actually happens incredibly quickly. Uh, Adam and Eve really doesn't take very long for them not to be able to resist eating from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil because they wanted to be gods themselves. They didn't want to be under God in the garden. They wanted to be gods. They wanted to know what God knows. And if we reflect on that, actually, that is still the situation today. If you kind of scroll back, scroll back, scroll back to the root cause of, of the sin that surrounds us and that we struggle with ourselves, it comes down to this, that we don't want to be under God, we want to be God. So that fall, and they're expelled from paradise, that unbelievably happens um, by the end of chapter three of Genesis. So you've only had three chapters of the Bible and we've gone creation fall. And if you look at the other end, the last book in the Bible, Revelation, is about the consummation. It's describing what is gonna happen when Christ comes again and takes us home to the new heaven and the new earth. So we've talked about creation, fall, consummation. The middle bit is, is redemption. So you think how big a book the Bible is. From Genesis chapter three, the third chapter in the Bible, right the way through to the last but one chapter in the Bible, the whole thing is about redemption. And what is redemption? Redemption is God calling us back, redeeming our lives, paying the price to enable us to come back into relationship with him, to enable us to walk through the gates of that new heaven and earth at the end of our lives. That's the work that he's doing. That's the glorious work that he's doing for us. And that new heaven and that new earth, Paul writes so beautifully um, about this in one of his other letters. He says, that new heaven and that new earth will be somewhere that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. What a beautiful, beautiful picture. And Christ, who makes all this possible, he doesn't just arrive in this massive story in a manger in Bethlehem. If you remember some of the other wonderful verses that we say in our Christmas services, Christ was the word at the very beginning of creation through whom everything was made. He was right there at the very beginning. He's also there all through the Old Testament. The prophets speak of this person, they don't give him a name. There are all sorts of shadows and pre-configuring um, of Christ in the Old Testament. On the road to Emmaus, in Luke's Gospel, he tells us Jesus meets these two disciples on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection. And Luke says that beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to the disciples what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So this massive story from creation to new creation, God has a plan, and it is Jesus Christ himself who is the whole plan. He is everything in that story. Alistair McGrath is a theologian. He talks about Jesus' life on earth is the climax of history. You might think that's a bit strange. Why is that? We're not at the end of history yet. The reason is from the moment that Jesus is resurrected, 
everything is on an inexorable movement and journey towards the new heaven and the new earth. It starts there and nothing can stop it. God's plan will not be thwarted. So we are already caught up on that journey. We're already being carried to that place. And as Christians, really we're, we're called to live, and in fact it's a great gift and a joy to live our lives in that context of eternity. Evelyn Underhill, who was a great spiritual writer of the last century, um, talked about this uh, as follows, with this widening of our horizon, you know, if we, we get this eternal horizon, our lives are seen in scale. There seem to be within this vast abiding spiritual world, fixed and lit by a steady spiritual light. And once we see that, but once there's this new coherence, everything kind of makes sense, and we have a new tranquility and a, and a sense of release in our lives, that life and a, uh, our life is bigger than what we see before us. She talks about it, our lives, thinking about our lives as like a chalet in the Alps. This homely existence, the chalet or our, our own individual lives, gains dignity and it gains significance from the greatness of the sky above it and the beauty of the everlasting hills behind it. And it's this sure hold on the eternal that gives each of our lives, it gives my life and it gives your life, meaning and direction. Because it means that our lives have meaning beyond this life. You know, as precious as this life is, and it's a gift from God, it's not the main event. The main event is the new heaven and earth that we are going to be welcomed into. It's the eternity that is the main event. We are citizens of heaven, not of earth. And that means that we each have a role to play in this work of redemption. So it talks about the fact that between creation, fall, and the new heaven and the new earth, the Lord is doing this massive work of redemption to bring everything. He wants to bring everything back to him. As Christians, when we come uh, into our faith, we come into this glorious, joyful, wonderful relationship with Christ. But also what we come into is a calling to serve Christ, not just to be with him, but to serve him. That is part of what it means to be a Christian. Henri Nguyen um, explained it by saying that each of us has a mission in life. But he says, we seldom fully realize that we are sent to fulfill God-given tasks. Instead, we act as if we were simply dropped down in creation and have to decide how to entertain ourselves until we die. But we were sent into the world just as Jesus was. Or as Paul says in chapter 2, we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That's an incredibly exciting verse when you really think about it. He created those works in advance for us to do. What does that mean? That means from the beginning of time, before even creation happened, God had a plan for our lives. Before the beginning of time, God had a plan for my life. God had a plan for your life. And that plan was around how we as individuals would contribute to his kingdom. This means there has always been a calling on my life. There has always been a calling on your life. And he created us as the unique individuals that we are, with all our strengths and weaknesses and our funny little things, he created us so that we're the perfect shape for that calling. We're perfectly equipped for that calling. So we may read of these amazing people in the Bible and feel overwhelmed by them and look at and say, I could never do that. My goodness, look at Paul. Probably we could, we could never do what Paul did because that wasn't what we're called to do. But we do have a calling. 
something that God is asking us and has designed for us to do. Which really then begs the question, well, how do I know what that calling is? The first thing that's really important to remember is that we're all different. St. Francis on his deathbed said to his brother Friars, I have done what was mine to do. May Christ teach you what is yours to do. So we're each unique. There's never been anybody like you, there will never be anybody like you. You've been made unique for a purpose. If he wanted us all to do the same things, he would have made us all the same. We are unique and we each have a unique calling. And all those callings are equally valuable to God. It's really, really important that we be ourselves, that we grow into those unique people that God made us to be. It's a tragedy when we think that we have to be somebody else or we aspire to be somebody else. We are perfect as the people that God designed us to be. So to close, I just want to offer three things to think about in terms of calling. The first is, if you think, I, I don't know, the Lord has never spoken to me, never said a word to me about calling. It's good to remember that actually all of us have a foundational calling, which is our particular way of obeying the two commandments that Jesus gave us which were to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and to love your neighbor as yourself. These are not easy, but we're all called to do them in our own particular way, in our own place with the people around us. The second is a little bit similar, which is not to forget that calling actually, as well as being like a long-term thing, is actually a day-to-day -day thing. So there's a great uh, spiritual writer called Jean-Pierre de Caussade who called this the duty of the present moment. In the present moment, I have a duty to do something for God if he calls me. So what might that look like? That might look like really starting the day by saying, Lord, I am yours today. Use me as you want to use me. And then just looking for the signs during the day that he may be calling you to do something, where the Holy Spirit is just kind of poking you a bit. So it may be that you feel drawn into it, think, I feel I should go and talk to that person. Or I kind of feel like I'm standing here thinking about, oh, what a, I really think she's a, he, he or she's just, that's such a nice thing they just did, but I don't tell them. And the Holy Spirit may be saying, just go and tell them, encourage them. And it's important that we listen to that first thought, because quite often what happens, especially if we're British, is that very quickly the logical mind comes in and says, oh no, I, I'm sure that's wrong, that'll be terribly embarrassing, like, we don't want to speak to me and all the rest of it. But it's the first nudge of the Holy Spirit that we should hang on to. The third one is what we probably most think about when we think about calling. You know, what is my big, what's the big thing that God's calling me to do with my life? And I think we'll probably find most of us, there are probably a number of different things, it's not just one thing, but the bigger things. It was really St. Ignatius who really wrote the book on this. He um, wrote the book, designed the t-shirt. One of his principles, which is really useful, but also very beautiful, is that God calls us through our deepest desires. We kind of get away, we need to get away from this idea that, oh, I don't want to know what God's calling me to because he's going to call me something awful. He's going to ask me to be a missionary or something. He's going to ask me to sell my house. No, the Lord, the Lord calls us through our deepest desires. And how do we know what those are? We need to find, we need to try to find some space to sit and listen and try to get beneath the day-to-day -day clutter and chatter. That's not easy. But it's already there inside of us. The deepest desire is what God wrote on our heart, our heart's desire when he made us. So it's not a question of waiting for him to like drop it down on our heads. It's already there. So we can pray to the Lord and ask him to reveal that to us. We can ask a very simple question of ourselves. What is it that I most want for my life? And see where that leads us. I want to give us a chance to take some quiet right now.